Winston Churchill wanted the British back in Malaya as soon as possible. Outside of India, Malaya was Britain's most economically important colony in the Far East, as well as the location for Britain's greatest ever military defeat at Singapore, the hands of the Japanese in February 1942. Lord Louis Mountbatten, who had been appointed Supreme Allied Commander Southeast Asia, or SEAC, at Churchill's urgings had for some years tried to work up military strategies for the recapture of Malaya and Singapore, but all of their efforts had been frustrated largely by American refusals to support any operations that were likely to give Britain a say in the war in the Pacific. Operation Culverin was the first SEAC initiative offered to Churchill and the Joint Chiefs in London. The daring assault on the northern tip of Sumatra in the Dutch East Indies had been formally proposed in February 1944, but met resistance from the US Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, D.C. Mountbatten's plan was vetoed by the joint opposition of the Americans, particularly Mountbatten's own acerbic deputy, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell, and the chiefs in London, who felt the whole operation to be impractical and far too risky. Although Mountbatten had been stymied over Culverin, he soon rallied and proposed a totally new operation that would have propelled Britain firmly into the centre of the stage in the Pacific War alongside the Americans, instead of remaining relegated to a supporting role, slogging through the jungles and hills of Burma. At last, Britain would have equal billing and a say in the outcome of the Japanese war. The plan, codenamed Operation Zipper, would have led to nothing less than the recapture of Malaya and Singapore. It would have eliminated at a stroke an important Japanese naval base and isolated the huge Japanese garrison in Malaya, leaving it to wither on the vine. A fight for Singapore would have erased the shame and humiliation of 1942 and resulted in the liberation of tens of thousands of British, Australian and Indian prisoners of war, along with civilian internees held in camps on the island. According to Special Operation Executive's Far Eastern Unit, Force 136, the figures for British and Commonwealth prisoners being held in Singapore and Malaya were considerably less now that the Japanese had shipped so many north to labour on the Burma-Thailand Railway and others to Manchuria and Japan as slaves. However, considerable numbers did remain in appalling conditions in camps all the way down the peninsula. In Singapore, Changi Camp still housed 14,900 POWs, considerably reduced from the original 50,000 who had been marched in to the former British cantonment in February 1942. Travelling north through Malaya, there were many camps filled with starving, diseased and filthy wrecks of human beings praying for deliverance. In Johor, 300 POWs of unknown nationality were in Moar Camp, and 500 Indians at Kloang. An unknown number sweated it out at Endau, while 500 Australians had been positively identified at Johor Bahru, while at Batu Pahat, another camp contained an unknown number of prisoners. At Kuala Lumpur, capital of Malaya, 2,500 Indian POWs and an unknown number of whites languished in camps, while at Negri Simbelan, 1,000 white prisoners of unknown nationality were inside the camp at Port Dixon. For Mountbatten, Zipper was to be his apotheosis as supreme commander. The plan was simple. First, the British would seize the Thai island of Phuket in Operation Roger. Then, invasion forces would land on the Malayan Peninsula and advance down to Singapore and invest the island from the rear, just as the Japanese had done in 1942. The Americans accepted the operation in principle, but on a reduced scale. Roger was dropped because the British lacked sufficient naval strength, and the Americans were concerned lest the British not send fleet carriers to reinforce the new British Pacific Fleet that was to operate in Admiral Nimitz's area of responsibility, in effect backing up American strategic aims, not British. Mountbatten told Clement Attlee that he would conquer Singapore before the end of 1945, quote, provided that the light fleet carriers which were provisionally promised to me are not sent to the Pacific, unquote. The Admiralty, however, had other plans for these larger aircraft carriers and was determined to send them to Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser's new British Pacific Fleet for operations exclusively supporting the American sphere of operations under Nimitz.
Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham wrote in his diary a week later, quote, We turned down Mountbatten's attempt to steal the light fleet carriers, unquote. Admiral Truebridge, the fifth sea lord, told Mountbatten in July 1945 that the decision to remove the carriers from SEAC control had been Cunningham's alone. Admiral Fraser had said that, in his opinion, the carriers could have been spared to take part in Zipper before they were needed in the Pacific. Cunningham did not like Mountbatten, and the fleet carrier decision was indicative of the infighting among the top brass that hampered Mountbatten's ability to prosecute the war, as much as disagreements with the Americans. Not to be outdone, Mountbatten raised the fleet carrier issue with the Defence Committee of the Cabinet, but Cunningham sidestepped the issue. Mountbatten was told that he would have to make do with smaller escort carriers to provide air cover during the crucial early phases of the invasion until airstrips could be created or captured ashore in Malaya. Mountbatten was not phased and decided that on reflection it was probably better to just strike directly at Malaya instead of any subsidiary targets before the main show. The forces at Mountbatten assembled for Zipper were impressive. Four Indian infantry divisions, containing the usual British and Indian battalions, were to be supported by an Indian tank brigade, three commando brigade and five parachute brigade. Preliminary bombardment of Japanese positions would be conducted by RAF bomber squadrons operating out of the Cocos Islands and southern Burma. Closer inshore, two Royal Navy battleships and a host of cruisers and destroyers would pound Japanese beach defences and cover the initial assaults. Nine escort carriers would provide air cover for the operation until suitable airstrips could be seized in Malaya. It was planned that within seven weeks of D-Day, SEAC would have ashore 182,000 men, 18,000 vehicles and a quarter of a million tonnes of supplies. Quote, it is a measure of Mountbatten's dogged determination and implacability that he managed to assemble a very considerable force for his own final act, unquote, which some historians have likened to his overlord, referring to the Normandy landings. Training for the operation was well advanced. It also represented for the British a final strategic gamble designed to put them onto a nearly equal footing with General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz. Already, Operation Dracula had been postponed in favour of a drive to liberate northern Burma and thereby assist the Americans in completing the Lado Road into China. Dracula, in its original form in July 1944, was an earlier operation to have put Britain squarely into the focus in the Pacific, would have witnessed the British seize Rangoon and push on to cross the Setang River and cut the Japanese Burma-Thailand Railway. Japanese forces in Malaya and Thailand would have been isolated, and the operation would have undoubtedly led to the liberation of tens of thousands of Allied prisoners of war being held in inhuman conditions of suffering in Japanese concentration camps along the railway line. The battle for Normandy in France had taken priority between June and August 1944, and SEAC's plan was frustrated by a lack of landing craft and naval support vessels to launch Dracula. Although Dracula was dusted off and actually initiated in May 1945, most of the hard fighting for Burma had already been completed by General Bill Slim's 14th Army, and when Allied forces assaulted Rangoon, they discovered that the Japanese had already mostly departed, leaving behind a thousand bedraggled British POWs in the city jail. Zipper had seen the British gather together a strong force that was put through intensive training. Every officer and man who was due to take part was put through a six-week dry-shod course in half that length of time by a very efficient Combines Operations training team. Troops practiced swimming in full equipment. The Royal Lake in Rangoon was used for pontoon bridging and outboard motorboat training. Units and brigade groups rehearsed beach landings. Two sites chosen for the zipper landings in Malaya were Port Dixon and Port Swettenham. Combined Operations Pilotage Parties, COP, had already been ashore secretly and they had reported that the beaches were ideal for a landing in force. Suddenly, Mountbatten's plans were struck a new and unexpected blow, this time struck not by the Americans but by the British government. On the 8th of June 1945, the government announced Operation Python. The Secretary of State for War, P.J. Grigg, announced the operation. 
It meant that service time abroad for soldiers serving in SEAC was cut from three years and eight months to three years and four months. At a stroke, Mountbatten would lose many of his most experienced soldiers just as Zipper was about to be launched. Mountbatten was not consulted, and it appeared to be an appalling act of vandalism enacted against Zipper by his own government. Quote, the 32,300 officers and men who get to go home earlier will presumably be delighted, said Mountbatten, but the million-odd men in the Navy, Army and Air Forces who are now condemned to inactivity will moulder and rot, unquote. Zipper had already been delayed once, and now Mountbatten faced more problems. This wasn't just bad manners, said Mountbatten, of Grigg's decision to enact Python early. It was military insanity. Suddenly we faced having to recast all our plans, and even postpone Zipper yet again. Mountbatten argued that, quote, the greater the delay, the stronger would be the enemy build-up, especially in Singapore, and the greater the suffering and mortality among civilian detainees and prisoners of war, unquote. His arguments fell upon deaf ears. Also in June 1945, after a meeting with General MacArthur in newly liberated Manila, Mountbatten was informed that the SEAC area of responsibility was to be increased, so the Americans could concentrate on the proposed invasion of Japan, Operation Downfall, scheduled to begin in December 1945. Added to Mountbatten's sphere of influence was the rest of the Netherlands East Indies, the Portuguese colony of East Timor and all of the island of Borneo located below the equator. Mountbatten enjoyed his first meeting with MacArthur and accepted the expansion of his sphere of operations, later writing, quote, I thought I ought to go and see MacArthur in Manila and flew off. I had heard much about his presence and his powers, that he was an outstanding figure. When we met, I wasn't disappointed. He was a terrific man. He simply oozed personality. He was also, unlike me, a complete autocrat. We got on marvellously, and our talks were terribly useful. Unquote. Mountbatten was forced to delay launching Zipper until the 9th of September as a result of Operation Python. The question was, why had the British government enacted Python when they knew that Zipper was about to be launched? It appears that the answer was political. A general election was coming up, and the government was after servicemen's votes. Quote, it looks like an electioneering dodge, unquote, opined Admiral Cunningham in one of his rare displays of support for Mountbatten. According to Lieutenant General Sir Henry Pownall, Mountbatten's chief of staff, Grigg did not like Mountbatten, and he used Python to attack him personally. Quote, now, when P.J. Grigg doesn't like someone, he does not neglect an opportunity to stick in a knife, unquote. In reality, although Grigg may have thought that he was sticking one on Mountbatten, in reality this cheap and self-serving ploy was actually hurting the British war effort and costing British lives. Python had destroyed any chance of Zipper being launched before the Japanese surrender, and it doomed hundreds of POWs to death, as relief never reached them until three weeks after the surrender. Many lives would have been saved as the camps would have been liberated, as the Zipper forces pushed out from the beachheads. It also robbed the British of a chance to finally lay to rest the humiliation of Singapore's surrender in February 1942 by wresting control of the city back off the Japanese by force. Operation Python must rank as one of the classic examples of a self-serving politician meddling in military affairs to the detriment of people's lives. In July, Mountbatten intended to fly to London to try and get additional supplies from the Chiefs of Staff, but he was diverted by Churchill and flew on to a wrecked and gutted Berlin to attend the Potsdam Conference, the meeting that decided the shape of the post-war world, and also set the stage for the Cold War. At Potsdam, General George C. Marshall, U.S. Chief of Staff, took Mountbatten aside and told him, in the strictest secrecy, that the United States had the atomic bomb and that they would drop it on Japan in early August. Later that same day, Prime Minister Churchill confirmed Marshall's comments to Mountbatten. Quote, you are going to have to revise your plans, said Churchill to Mountbatten. The war with Japan will be over in less than a month. We are going to use a new bomb, an atomic bomb, against the cities of Japan, and the emperor will be forced to capitulate. Unquote. The new American president, Harry S. Truman, told Mountbatten the same thing as well, though he failed to inform MacArthur. 
the news concerned Mountbatten. Quote, Mountbatten had always believed that the Japanese had to be defeated in the field, demonstrably defeated, and was appalled at the nation being given a chance to surrender before this happened. They had to lose face, unquote. Would the Japanese surrender before Mountbatten could launch Operation Zipper was the question uppermost in his mind. The operation could take place no earlier than the 9th of September because of Operation Python, and it seemed unlikely that the Japanese would continue to fight for that long. Quote, it was no use Mountbatten arguing that the greater the delay, the stronger would be the enemy build-up, especially in Singapore, and the greater the suffering and mortality among civilian detainees and prisoners of war, unquote. All such entreaties to Churchill and Truman fell upon deaf ears. The planning, training and organisation involved in putting together Zipper was not going to be wasted. SEAC would soon be in a race to save the lives of POWs and civilian internees held all across Asia as the war wound down to its last bloody axe at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In Singapore, when the Japanese turned on their wireless sets and listened intently to the reedy voice of Emperor Hirohito ordering them to endure the unendurable at midday on the 15th of August 1945, they were all shocked and incredulous. None was more shocked than Lieutenant General Seishiro Itagaki, commander of the 25th Area Army Group in Singapore. Hurried and urgent conferences were convened by harried staff officers and worried commanders, and Itagaki told his subordinates that he was unwilling to surrender his army to the Allies and would instead fight on to the death. The Kempei Thai military police were informed that as part of contingency plans for such an eventuality, originally issued by the War Ministry in Tokyo on the 1st of August 1944, Quote, it is the aim not to allow the escape of a single prisoner of war, to annihilate them all and not leave any traces. Unquote. Vice Minister Shitayama of the Ministry of War in Tokyo issued instructions to Japanese occupation forces across Asia to quote, prevent the prisoners of war from falling into the enemy's hands. Unquote. This was further clarified by Allied war crimes investigators after the war was over, when they obtained a document outlining Japanese government policy from Sadayoshi Nakanishi, acting director of the Prisoner of War Information Bureau in Tokyo. The document reiterated earlier orders and stated that, quote, prisoners of war must be prevented by all possible means from falling into enemy hands, unquote. The term all possible means was left up to individual Japanese commanders to decide upon methods to be employed. In Singapore, the furious Kempei Tai began to prepare to enact a final massacre of all Allied POWs before the British arrived to reclaim their colony. Three days later, General Itagaki flew to Hanoi in French Indochina to meet with his superior, Field Marshal Count Tarauchi, commander of the Japanese Southern Army. Tarauchi ordered Itagaki to put all thoughts of a glorious death in battle to one side, and to obey the order of his commander-in-chief, the Emperor, and surrender unconditionally to the Allies. Mountbatten was in London when the Japanese abruptly and unexpectedly surrendered. Churchill telephoned him, quote, Well, Dickie, I hope that you have made all plans, that you are ready to send your first aeroplane into Singapore tomorrow, unquote. The problem facing Mountbatten was the question of whether to cancel Zipper or not. Everyone at SEAC was unsure of Japanese intentions, and General Itagaki and many of his senior commanders did indeed favour fighting on from their prepared positions, regardless of the Emperor's order. With the delay imposed by Python, some of the ships were no longer available. Mountbatten decided that an occupation force needed to be put into Malaya and Singapore as soon as possible, and the zipper plan offered the easiest way to do this. He pared back the operation's more offensive elements, losing the armour, and instead concentrated on a scaled-back version of the original plan. In addition, a naval task force would be the first British forces to arrive in Singapore, and they would disembark Royal Marines and other forces onto Singapore Island itself a few days before the first zipper forces stormed ashore on the peninsula. This new part of the plan was codenamed Operation Tide Race. Mountbatten realised from his reports from Force 136's E Group on the ground in Malaya that time was of the essence. He must get British forces into Singapore and Malaya before the Japanese killed any more Allied POWs.
or before starvation and disease caused any more deaths. In the back of his mind was the thought that the Japanese might enact plans for a widespread slaughter of Allied POWs and civilian internees as a final act before surrender. The relief was tangible at SEAC headquarters in Kandy, Sri Lanka, when a signal arrived on the 20th of August 1945 from the Japanese commander in Singapore, General Itagaki. He stated that he would abide by Emperor Hirohito's decision, and that he and every officer and man, the 25th Area Army, was ready to receive instructions for the surrender of Singapore and Malaya. A special naval task group codenamed Tide Race had begun gathering in Rangoon, Burma and Trincomalee in Sri Lanka. Admiral Arthur Power, Commander-in-Chief of the British East Indies Fleet, had hand-picked 56-year-old Rear Admiral Cedric Holland to lead Tide Race as Naval Force Commander and to act as SEAC Naval Representative in accepting the initial Japanese surrender of Singapore aboard his flagship, the heavy cruiser HMS Sussex, in Keppel Harbour. In Singapore, General Itagaki gathered his army staff and senior commanders together at his headquarters inside Raffles College at Bukit Timar village and informed them that they were under orders to also obey the surrender instructions from Tokyo. All thoughts of resistance were to be abandoned and the peace was to be maintained until the British arrived to take over. Many did not take Itagaki's order well. They had expected a glorious final battle with the British, not the ignominy of surrender. This ran contrary to everything that these officers had been taught since cadet school. Surrender was shameful, even a surrender forced upon them by their god emperor. That evening, over 300 Japanese officers held a farewell sake party in the Raffles Hotel. Once they were sufficiently full of alcohol and had said their personal goodbyes and saluted the emperor, hand grenades were distributed. One by one, the officers pulled out the pins on the grenades, bashed them onto a hard surface to arm them, and clutched them close to their bodies. The carnage was horrific, with smouldering bodies, miners' arms and heads flung all over the room, blood pooling in huge quantities across the floor. Other officers drew short swords and ritually disemboweled themselves in the traditional manner. The officers killing themselves believed that they were leaving the war with their honour intact, but for others who did not take part, the act of suicide was against the orders issued by their emperor, and they remained stoically at their posts. The Japanese Kempei Tai military police were under no illusions as to their likely fate once the British arrived to assume control in Singapore. They were men living on borrowed time. Itagaki actively collaborated with the Kempei Tai by suppressing the news of Japan's surrender, keeping it secret from the population. Between the 15th and the 18th of August, the Japanese had continued to administer Singapore as if the war was still being fought, giving the Kempei Tai precious time to conduct some spring cleaning. They were extremely busy, for their extensive war crimes against POWs, civilian internees and the local population had left a huge amount of paperwork and bodies to be disposed of before curious Allied investigators arrived on the scene. It was imperative for all concerned, including the senior army officers who had permitted and condoned endless atrocities, including Itagaki, to destroy all evidence that linked them to violations of international law. It is perhaps not surprising that Itagaki would make sure that the Kempei Tai was given enough time to cleanse its files of incriminating evidence, and to make its plans for escape from Singapore, as he was a former head of the Kempei Tai intelligence section of the Guangdong Army in China during the early 1930s. In September 1931, the then Colonel Itagaki had engineered the attack on the South Manchurian railway line that had precipitated the Japanese occupation of Manchuria. Quote, I have been going into the question of our prisoners of war, remarked Lieutenant General Sir Henry Pownall, Mountbatten's chief of staff, two weeks before the Japanese surrender. And it seems we have been rather caught with our trousers down, unquote. To say that the British were unprepared for the horror that awaited them inside liberated POW camps is an understatement. And what was being done to POWs still under the control of the Japanese was as equally unforgivable. On the 19th of August 1945, two important things occurred in Singapore. Firstly, General Itagaki finally released the news of the Japanese surrender to the local media 
and General MacArthur stopped Operations Zipper and Tide Race in their tracks. On the same day, British naval and military forces that were steaming at full speed through the Straits of Malacca towards Singapore were suddenly ordered to cut speed and loiter. The order came from MacArthur's Supreme Headquarters in Manila. It stated that no officer was to take a Japanese surrender anywhere in the occupied territories until after General MacArthur had taken the formal Japanese surrender in Tokyo. No one would be permitted to upstage America's favourite wartime hero in the moment of his greatest triumph, and it was abundantly clear to America's allies that this was not a negotiable point. Mountbatten was appalled, and he immediately protested to MacArthur, pointing out that, quote, the delay might mean the difference between life and death for prisoners of war at starvation level, unquote. MacArthur simply replied, quote, keep your pants on, to which Mountbatten caustically wired back, quote, will keep mine on if you take Hirohito's off, unquote. MacArthur remained adamant, and Mountbatten was forced to order the ships of Operation Tide Race not to enter Keppel Harbour in Singapore until MacArthur had performed his greatest publicity show aboard the battleship USS Missouri moored in Tokyo Bay. In the meantime, Singapore descended into anarchy and chaos. Force 136 had offered to assist SEAC with maintaining order until the invasion forces arrived to take control of Malaya and Singapore, but the offer had been rejected because no one believed that there was going to be a substantial delay between the Japanese surrender and the arrival of British forces. However, the sudden order from General MacArthur's headquarters meant that there would be an almost three-week power vacuum that would be quickly filled by guerrilla groups and units of the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army, the MPAJA. The mainly Chinese communist MPAJA units seized certain towns in Malaya, making it harder for the British to re-establish their colonial administration without problems in the future. Force 136 had already infiltrated 77 British officers in-country, but they could do nothing to prevent the anarchy that followed the Japanese surrender. In Singapore, quote, collaborators were hunted down and their bodies left hanging from trees. Mistresses of the Japanese had their heads shaved and were paraded and spat on before being beaten or stabbed to death by the crowds, unquote. On the 25th of August, General Itagaki had tried to use his remaining powers to calm the lawlessness that had turned Singapore into a morass of violence, looting and murder. He issued a proclamation banning demonstrations and meetings of more than 500 people. This was ignored, and law and order completely collapsed. Malay guerrillas and MPAJA troops raided Japanese bases for weapons and ammunition. The civil population ignored the Japanese because they knew that Itagaki would not unleash armed soldiers against them now that Japan had surrendered. If he had ordered the gunning down of looters and rioters, he would have been branded a war criminal. The once mighty Japanese were effectively impotent and forced to remain under arms in their barracks. Flight Lieutenant F. L. Andrews glanced from his cockpit displays to his engines as his RAF Mosquito started to make some strange sounds. Andrews and his navigator, Warrant Officer N. S. Painter, were flying a photo reconnaissance mission over Singapore in advance of Operation Tide Race, having flown in from the Cocos Islands where No. 684 Squadron was based. The strange-sounding engine noise was cause for concern. Quote, Although the crew were not in immediate danger, they were faced with a difficult decision. Should they try to fly back across the Indian Ocean, with the possibility of being forced to ditch, or risk a landing in Singapore? Although the war had ended, it was still unclear whether the Japanese in Singapore and Malaya would surrender peacefully. After some debate, they agreed to risk a landing." Unquote. After selecting Kalang Airfield, the Mosquito circled over the field several times as Andrew checked the runway for bomb craters and debris. It was clear, and he brought the plane down safely, Japanese ground controllers waving the Mosquito into a camouflage dispersal bay. Armed Japanese soldiers and airmen crowded around the RAF plane, and a few tense moments passed as the two Englishmen tried to communicate with them. An interpreter was summoned, and he arrived with a gang of cheering British prisoners of war who had been working on the airfield under Japanese guards, even though the Japanese had surrendered. 
Amongst the POWs was an RAF engineering officer and a fitter, and between them these two men managed to repair the engine problem, even though they had no experience with this type of aircraft. Next day, Andrews took the Mosquito up and headed back to the Cocos Islands, having previously sent a radio message reporting his arrival in Singapore ahead of the fleet. At 4.30pm on the 2nd of September 1945, the first ships of Admiral Holland's tide race convoy arrived at Penang Island on the west coast of Malaya. The island and its Japanese garrison had already surrendered to a British task group, the naval force, consisting of the battleship HMS Nelson, the cruiser Ceylon, escort carriers Hunter and Attacker, supported by three destroyers and two landing ship infantry, had sailed from Rangoon, Burma. The task group commander, Admiral Walker, had received a signed document from the local Japanese naval and military commanders in Penang promising not to attack the British fleet. This was five days before the official Japanese surrender ceremony in Tokyo Bay, and against American orders. In one of the ironies of war, the Japanese naval commander of Penang turned up to surrender, wearing among his medals the British Distinguished Service Cross. Rear Admiral Jisaku Oizumi had served with the Japanese fleet in the First World War, when Japan was Britain's ally. On the 3rd of September, Walker put ashore 480 marines. Quote, as the Royal Marines moved through the island to take over Bayon Lepas airfield and other installations from the Japanese, food riots broke out. The riots were eventually quelled, but it was a clear sign of things to come. Unquote. In the meantime, Operation Tide Race had progressed on schedule. The suddenness of the Japanese surrender caught unprepared none more so than Mountbatten and Siak. Force 136 was also unprepared, but was forced to adapt quickly to the new situation and assist with aiding prisoners of war. Quote, Packing supplies containers was started even before full information was available. First thoughts were that the priorities would be food, blankets, clothing and pharmaceuticals. In fact, requirements turned out to be in exactly reverse order. This meant a great deal of additional working and repacking, unquote. Mountbatten did try to circumvent MacArthur's immoral and self-serving order to some degree. He ordered Force 136 to directly intervene in Malaya. Over the past three years, agents from 136, working closely with local guerrilla forces and other allies, have managed to locate around 250 Japanese POW camps within the entire SIAC area of responsibility. The Force 136 personnel involved in this operation were known as E-Group, and they had had special responsibility, apart from locating prison camps, at aiding the escape of POWs so they could be returned to the British war effort. SIAC had relatively detailed knowledge of not only the location of camps, but also the numbers of prisoners held by the Japanese. Force 136 estimated that there were 70,000 British, Empire and Commonwealth POWs, plus a further 55,000 POWs on the island of Java in the Dutch East Indies, which was just outside of SEAC jurisdiction. Mountbatten, in an effort to preserve POW lives until such time as he could send in proper military forces, instructed Force 136 to do what it could until proper relief forces could be sent in. 136 responded with a two-pronged operation. The first part, codenamed Birdcage, saw the RAF airdrop millions of leaflets, giving notice of the surrender of Japan to camp guards, to the local population and POWs and civilian internees. Leaflets were dropped in Japanese and local languages first onto all of the known camps, main towns and concentrations of Japanese troops. One hour later, millions of leaflets were drop printed in English, giving instructions to POWs and internees to stay in the camps until contacted so that food and medical supplies could be parachuted to them. Phase 2, codenamed Mastiff, saw the dispatch of dozens of small teams from Force 136, who were parachuted at great personal risk into hostile territory crawling with unpredictable Japanese. Earlier, Mountbatten had ordered small Force 136 teams to set up close to known camps in the jungle and observe carefully what was going on inside them through binoculars. 
if it looked as though the Japanese were killing prisoners, as many in Siak and indeed MacArthur's own area feared the Japanese might have done even after the surrender as per their orders of the 1st of August 1944. The Force 136 commandos were to intervene. What a team numbering only three or four men could have done when confronted by dozens of well-armed Japanese guards does not bear thinking about, but although it was a rather futile gesture on Mountbatten's part, at least he tried to do something. Quote, the urgency involved was considerable because of the deplorable conditions of prisoners in the camps, particularly on the Burma Road. Force 136 had a very wide distribution of parties in the field, and so had been enabled to make the initial contacts." Unquote. Once the surrender was fully established, food, medical supplies, and medical and Red Cross relief teams with wireless operators parachuted into the known camps as quickly as possible. Once the initial drops had been made, the RAF was tasked with keeping these camps resupplied by dropping special food, medical supplies, clothing and Red Cross stores. RAF squadrons based at Jisor near Calcutta in India dropped supplies into eastern Thailand and French Indochina, while planes operating out of Colombo in Sri Lanka and the Cocos Islands parachuted canisters into Malaya and Sumatra. Squadrons operating from recently liberated Rangoon in Burma covered western Thailand. In total, 700 tons of supplies were dropped. Liberators were used for the long-range drops, as the crews had been making clandestine long-duration missions into Japanese territory as part of 4C's E-Group operations for some years. Shorter-range airdrops were undertaken by Lysander, Thunderbolt and Dakota squadrons. These supplies undoubtedly saved the lives of many prisoners who were at their most vulnerable, but it was still a drop in the ocean when the mathematics was examined. Only 2.8 tonnes of supplies per camp. It would have been unthinkable for Mountbatten to have ignored MacArthur's vainglorious order the 19th of August, ordering his forces to stay out of Singapore until further notice. The ramifications for the special relationship between America and Britain would have been huge, but I'm sure the thought did cross the mind of so inveterate a gambler as Mountbatten. He had already been nicknamed Linga Longa Louis by British POWs who patiently awaited liberation. Acutely conscious that MacArthur's order was going to cost British lives, he had, as we have seen, ordered Force 136 to activate some limited operations to assist POWs and internees, but he knew that these were not enough to save him from the approbation of men who had suffered the torments of the dam for years on end and who remained under Japanese guards still. Two Australian historians have noted of this urgent period, quote, Britain's reconquest of her Asian colonies was in the end a terribly decent affair, played according to the rules. Unquote. It is hard to argue with their assessment. On the 9th of September 1945, Operation Zipper, a plan much altered from the original, was finally launched. In the event, the operation did not go without a rather embarrassing hitch. The British still intended to make amphibious landings on the beaches at Port Dixon and Port Swettenham, and then drive south to Singapore. Already, British forces from Tide Race were ashore on Singapore Island. Obviously, no Japanese opposition was expected, so the aerial bombing and beach bombardment programs were shelved. Instead, landing craft would take the infantry and their light vehicles into the beaches, and they would pour ashore. Zipper becoming for all intents and purposes a gigantic training exercise for a teeth operation that never was. The plan was for the 25th Indian Infantry Division, under the command of Major General G. N. Wood, to land on the Morib beaches, 18 miles south of Port Swettenham on the 9th of September. Simultaneously, 37th Brigade from 23rd Indian Infantry Division would land on the beaches west of Sipang, 8 miles northwest of Port Dixon. The objectives were Kalanang Airfield and the Sipang Road Junction, respectively. After occupying the junction, 37 Brigade was to move south to Port Dixon, where the rest of 23rd Division under Major General D.C. Hawthorne would land over the beaches south of the town on the 12th of September. The problem was the beaches at Port Swettenham. 
Mountbatten's Combined Operations Pilotage Parties had reconnoitred the beaches weeks before the Japanese surrender, and they had reported them to be suitable for a major amphibious assault. But the commandos were wrong. If the landings had been opposed by the Japanese, the results could have been catastrophic for SEAC, especially as the original Zipper plan had called for the deployment of tanks with the first assault waves. The few tanks and armoured vehicles that accompanied Zipper fared no better. Quote, armour sank axle-deep into the sands below low water mark even before it confronted the worst hazard of the mangrove swamps ahead, unquote. Major General Overy Roberts, who accompanied 23rd Indian Infantry Division during the landings, later wrote, quote, Beach turned out to be far worse than anticipated. On the beaches we found that 47 vehicles were bogged and drowned, unquote. The only possible reconciliation for SEAC was the fact that had the invasion been launched as part of Operation Zipper before the Japanese surrender, it was later discovered that the Japanese only had a single infantry battalion of low calibre and lightly armed troops in the area to resist. The landings at Port Dixon, however, went without a hitch. In the wardroom aboard the Royal Navy heavy cruiser HMS Sussex, moored in the straits outside Singapore on the evening of the 4th of September, a host of naval officers in white shirts and shorts sat across a table from a small number of senior Japanese army officers. The most senior British officers present were Admiral Arthur Power, the Commander-in-Chief East Indies Fleet, who had just arrived aboard HMS Cleopatra and Lieutenant General Sir Philip Christison, commanding the 15th Indian Corps. Pen, ink and carefully typed papers were spread before the Japanese. The first person to take up a pen was General Itagaki, who after his consultation with Field Marshal Count Tarauchi had agreed to surrender Singapore to the British. The signing had been preceded by six hours of negotiations. The British had insisted that the Japanese gather together 100 large staff cars with drivers for the occupying forces, plus 500 lorries with drivers to assemble at the docks. A further 100 lorries were to assemble at Kalang Airfield. A curfew would run from sunset to sunrise, and all stocks of spirits and liquor shops were to be sealed and guarded. Reports were to be made to the British of all epidemic or infectious diseases in Singapore, and the location of all hospitals and laboratories provided. Also, the locations of all Allied men who were sick or injured were to be made known. The Alexandra Hospital, scene of a terrible massacre by Japanese troops in 1942, was to be emptied of all Japanese patients, except those unable or too sick to move and the building was to be cleaned and made ready for use by Allied forces. Interpreters and guides would be provided to the liberating forces. One Japanese general would report twice a day for orders to Major General Eric Mansa, commanding the 5th Indian Division, and the remaining 28 Japanese generals remain under guard at Raffles College. This was not the formal surrender of Japanese forces in the SEAC area of responsibility, which would happen a few days later in Singapore City. Itagaki would surrender only his 7th Area Army, which included a force of 70,000 troops of the 25th Army tasked with the defence of Singapore, and another 26,000 men in Malaya. But it was the de facto surrender of the Japanese. At 6.05pm, Itagaki signed, and Singapore was free. The British quickly moved to secure Singapore and to begin removing Japanese troops from the city and sorting out Allied POWs. By the 5th of September, 35,000 Japanese soldiers had been ordered into prison camps across the causeway in Johor, the first armed British troops to set foot on Singapore Island since the surrender of the 16th of February 1942 were in fact not British at all. Major Niaz Arbad was at the front of D Company 2nd 1st Punjab Regiment as they fanned out across the dock area, rifles at the port and eyes scanning the buildings for any signs of trouble. Quote, the battalion was met by two senior Japanese officers who wore ceremonial swords and highly polished jackboots. All were standing rigidly to attention at the salute. Behind them again was parked a line of glittering civilian cars, each with a booted chauffeur. Unquote. Next would come the overall Japanese surrender before Lord Mountbatten. 
General Itagaki and six of his most senior Japanese Army and Navy commanders in Singapore shuffled into the council chambers of Singapore's municipal buildings, their faces betraying little emotion. On this day, the 12th of September 1945, the stain of military embarrassment and regret that had dogged the British since Lieutenant General Arthur Percival had signed the instrument of surrender of all British and Commonwealth forces in Malaya in an ignominious little ceremony at the Ford Car Factory outside Singapore on the 15th of February 1942 was about to be expunged. Lord Mountbatten and his staff were to accept the final unconditional surrender of all Japanese Navy and Army units forming the Japanese Southern Area Army. The ceremonial had been pure theatre, designed not only to make clear to the tens of thousands of Japanese troops at liberty who was now in control, but also to impress upon the people of Singapore that firm British government had been restored and the colony brought back under imperial control. Mountbatten, dressed in naval whites, lines of metal ribbons making a bright splash of colour at his left shoulder, was driven through the streets crowded with local Singaporeans, troops and sailors recently arrived and released prisoners of war and civilian internees. Beside him sat Lieutenant General Raymond Speck Wheeler, his American principal logistics officer. At the steps of the municipal buildings, Mountbatten was met by his military commanders-in-chief. Four guards of honour had formed up, smart Royal Navy sailors in white tropical square rig, RAF airmen in shirt-sleeve order and white belts and bayonet scabbards, Australian soldiers in their distinctive bush hats and pin-sharp Indian troops, their white officers standing with drawn swords. Mountbatten processed down the ranks, pausing to speak to several of the men before taking the salute. A Royal Marines band played Rule Britannia, and in the background rolled out the booming detonations of artillery as a 17-gun salute was fired. High above the building, a huge Union flag hung imposingly, occasionally stirred by a lazy tropical breeze. The British were well and truly back. Inside the wood-panelled council chamber, its interior rather like a provincial English courtroom, a large portrait of the king and queen had been prominently rehung by the caretakers. The picture had been secreted away during the occupation. In the centre of the chamber, two highly polished long wooden tables had been placed six feet apart. At the one table would sit Mountbatten and the Siak leaders, while the other was reserved for the vanquished foe. Beneath the pillars that circled the chamber, armed guards stood stiffly at attention, each chosen to represent one of the victorious powers. France, Australia, the Netherlands, China, the United States, India and Great Britain. Fans turned lazily in the ceiling as the 400 spectators crammed into the galleries and floor space waited for the proceeding to begin. Sitting beside Mountbatten, apart from his protégés from SEAC Command in Kandy and his corps and divisional commanders, was General Sir Adrian Carton de Wiert and Major General Fang Yi, who had flown in from the nationalist capital at Chongqing, now called Chongqing in China. He carried a small camera and would provide one of the enduring images of the event as he snapped away at the grim-faced Japanese admirals and generals, their humiliation complete. Mountbatten scrutinised his enemies carefully. Quote, I had not liked the Japs when I had visited Japan in 1921, he wrote later. They seemed to me to be hard people with hard eyes. Now I knew just how horrible they were after seeing such terrible things in Singapore and in the camps. It was the one thing during the war that seared my mind. There were no extenuating circumstances, and I could find no compassion for them at all. I loathed them. That was why I didn't go to the Tokyo Bay surrender. I just couldn't have stood the sight of them all there. Unquote. The one major Japanese commander who was absent from the surrender ceremony was Field Marshal Count Tarauchi, who had commanded all Japanese forces in the southern area. He claimed that he was too unwell to travel from his headquarters in Vietnam for the ceremony. General Itagaki would sign in his stead. Mountbatten was determined that Tarauchi should not avoid his formal loss of face, and at the end of his speech he said, quote, But I have warned the field marshal that I shall expect him to make his personal surrender to me as soon as he is fit enough. Unquote. Mountbatten insisted that Japanese officers surrender their swords as part of the many ceremonies held throughout the Siak area. <laughs> 
when Tarauchi was fit enough to comply with Mountbatten's instructions nine weeks later. The Japanese surrendered a 13th and a 16th century katana sword. Mountbatten sent the 16th century example as a present to King George VI and kept the other one for himself. The sword was the soul of the samurai, so forcing Japanese officers to give up their swords, many of which were valuable family heirlooms and works of art, stripped them of their strutting, arrogant authority at a single stroke. General MacArthur thought the whole idea too archaic, and he believed that the act would lead to a severe loss of face, Mountbatten's intention, and a breakdown in discipline. Mountbatten made sure that the surrender ceremonies were always conducted in front of the ordinary Japanese soldiers, so they could watch their officers forced to lay their swords on the ground in front of victorious Allied officers. The swords were distributed among SEAC officials, and a few were sent back to Britain as gifts to certain beneficiaries. In later years, when it was realised that many of these swords were prized family heirlooms, some were quietly and discreetly returned to their Japanese owners. Lee Kuan Yew, later the first Prime Minister of Singapore, remarked of the sword ceremonies and the Japanese officers concerned, quote, The final humiliation of these little warriors was one of the greatest moments in the history of Southeast Asia, unquote. As Mountbatten watched the senior Japanese commanders sitting impassively at their long polished wooden table in the hushed atmosphere of the council chamber after signing the instrument of surrender, he felt only hatred for them, quote, I have never seen six more villainous, depraved or brutal faces in my life, he wrote later. I shuddered to think what it would have been like to be in their power. When they got off their chairs and shambled out, they looked like a bunch of gorillas, with great baggy breeches and knuckles almost trailing on the ground. Unquote. There is no doubting that Lord Mountbatten had been deeply affected by what he had seen in the recently liberated POW and internment camps in Malaya and Singapore. He felt strongly that those Japanese who were responsible for war crimes should have been dealt with harshly. In conversation with Richard Kirby of the Australian War Crimes Commission, who urged a degree of leniency towards a group of Japanese guards from the camps in Singapore, Mountbatten offered his own solution. Quote, I'd be more stern than that, said Mountbatten. If I had my way, I'd shoot about twenty of them. You've got to do something to satisfy the bloodlust. Then I'd officially kick about two hundred or three of them in the arse, in front of all the rest, and I'd let them go back to their countries with reprimands. And that would be the end of the whole show, old man. Unquote. Regarding the Japanese imperial family, Mountbatten harboured no illusions as to their culpability as war criminals. Quote, he thought they were all morons, inbred and degenerate, recorded American General Hap Arnold. Mountbatten said, quote, the royal family should all be liquidated. He knows them personally, unquote. Mountbatten also wanted to make sure that General MacArthur, who occupied Japan, did not fail in his duty to punish the Japanese for their crimes. Quote, I am sure that your views coincide with mine, namely, that it will be the greatest mistake to be sopped with the Japanese, he wrote to MacArthur shortly after the Japanese surrender. The fact that you have been prevented from inflicting the crushing defeat will, I fear, enable the Japanese leaders to delude their people into thinking they were defeated only by the scientists and not in battle, unless we can so humble them that the completeness of defeat is brought home to them." Unquote. Here, Mountbatten was referring to the American deployment of the atomic bomb to end the Pacific War, a move that had prevented MacArthur from launching Operation Downfall, the invasion of Japan in December 1945. It is interesting to note that Lord Mountbatten's hatred of the Japanese, perhaps the only occasion in his life when he expressed real animosity towards any group of people, lasted long after the war was over. In 1971, in their continuing efforts to be admitted back into the human race, the Japanese sent their wartime leader, Emperor Hirohito, on a state visit to Britain. The visit sparked understandably intense protests from British veterans of the war in Asia, especially amongst ex-POW groups. Many saw Hirohito as a war criminal who had escaped Allied prosecution only because MacArthur used him to help turn Japan into a bulwark against the spread of communism in Asia just after the war. Mountbatten initially refused to meet Hirohito and was finally forced to do so by the Queen, 
Mountbatten did manage to exclude himself from the state banquet that followed. After Mountbatten was assassinated by the IRA in 1979, Japan was the only great nation that was omitted from his state funeral. Mountbatten's principles remain firm to the end. Thanks for listening. Please visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.